Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Grace Place. If I could get everyone to stand up, we're going to worship the Lord. so glad that you woke up this morning and decided to join us here at the Grace Place. If you want to take a minute to say hi to the person next to you, the person behind you, somebody you don't know, now is the time. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Grace Place. It's so, so good to see all of you this morning. You can take a seat now, and then I will open up in a word of prayer. Thank you so much, Jesus, that we're able to worship you here at Vista School this morning. Thank you so much, Jesus, that we know that you are with us in this room. And thank you so much, Jesus, that you... Bring us together as a church family every Sunday morning. We, we need you and we need each other. And we just pray that you will use our time together this morning to bring all of us closer to you, Jesus. I pray all of this in your name, Jesus. Amen. 
So we have our young adult Bible study again at Chandley's house this coming Tuesday, same time, 7. And um, then Wednesday morning for all the ladies, uh, ladies Bible study at April's house. There are just a couple more weeks left this year before they take a summer break, but this coming Wednesday at 10 at April's house. And then uh, Wednesday night, we also meet at Gordon and April's house for our uh, Bible study. We still go through the merged Gospels. It's a wonderful study, so please join us for that. We meet at around 6.30 for a cup of coffee and then Bible study. And then for all of our youth, this coming um, Wednesday at 7, I don't know where it is. Where is youth group this coming Wednesday? <laughs> where? It's Sam's house. Okay, it's Sam's house. So if you don't know where Sam lives... Just give Dylan, Chanley, or Sarah a call or reach out to them today after the service, and they will let you know uh, where he lives. Okay. <laughs> so, and then for our worship evening, this coming Friday at 7, we'll meet at Chanley's house. So, please come and join us for that this coming Friday at 7. And then, one slide back for our men's Bible study at the Hope Chest, as usual, at 8 uh, this coming Saturday. So, please... Um, uh, join us for that. And then, please don't forget, next Sunday, we have our Acts 242 Sunday. We have this like once a month. We enjoy a meal together after our service. And for everyone who would say that the Grace Place is your church family, please stay for our church family meeting. We will have it also next Sunday um, after church. So next Sunday, Acts 242. Uh, if you want to bring something, that would be great. If you don't, that's great too. So please stay uh, with us. We always have enough uh, uh, food. And then we have our daily breads there, right there at the table. If you didn't have a chance to uh, get one, uh, you can get it today for the month of June, July, and August. And then we have two more things. The first one is for everyone who is here for the first time or who never filled out one of these connection cards, it would be so helpful if you could fill out one for us and put it there in the box or give it to me a little bit later. That would be very, very helpful. And our wonderful prayer team, they always love to pray for people. And so if you want to reach out to them after the service, uh, they have a red name tags, tag, so they are part of our prayer team. If you have a specific prayer request, you can fill out one of those um, uh, prayer cards and give it to them or put it there and then in the prayer box. And now I want to ask... Paul to come up and share a little bit with us what's going on this coming weekend, right? So I'm really excited about it, and uh, Paul wants to share with us. <laughs> well, thank, thank you so much. I feel like I'm up here a lot, um, and I apologize for that. If you're tired of looking at me, it's his fault. He told me it was okay. Uh, <laughs> um, I mentioned this at the uh, men's Bible study uh, last or uh, yesterday. Uh, I won't be able to be there next week because uh, we do an annual, uh, the Christian Motorcycle Association, um, and we do an annual fundraiser called Run for the Sun, and Sun is spelled S-O-N. Um, and uh, it's the only time that we actually do any fundraising uh, outside of our own membership. CMA members uh, pay for all of the administration of CMA. We pay to keep the lights on at our national headquarters, to pay utility bills, to pay for salaries and all that stuff. But once a year, we reach out to other believers to help us fund um, evangelism and outreach to the world. And so uh, we're going to be riding next uh, weekend, uh, next Saturday, actually. We'll be doing about almost a 300-mile ride around southern Utah, um, basically just kind of enjoying the beauty that God puts in front of us and uh, enjoying fellowship with. And if you ride a motorcycle, you're welcome to join us 10 o'clock at Zion Harley-Davidson on Saturday. Um, and we'll be leaving from there. But, uh, uh, we, and it's open to anybody. But anyway, we'll be doing that. But uh, I wanted to just kind of briefly talk about what we do with the money that people do donate to us. And I, I have some brochures. They're sitting over on the side table kind of next to the, the car magnets. Um, and if you're interested in sponsoring either Barb or I, the little flyers are over there, and you're welcome to, to do that. But uh, when we raise money uh, on, on Run for the Sun, 100% uh, of that money goes to outreach. So where does that go? Well, 60% of it actually is given to ministry partners that CMA works with. The Jesus Film Project uh, that most of you probably have heard of 
uh, if you were at our house about a month, a month and a half ago, I guess it was uh, Good Friday, um, we did the, the Jesus film at our house, and, and that film is shown around the world, and people, uh, they say one out of every ten people that watches that film internationally come to know Christ as, as a result of watching that film, so it's an extremely effective outreach tool. Uh, CMA also works with an organization called Open Doors, and Open Doors supports uh, the uh, persecuted church around the world and also provides Bibles in places where uh, it's just virtually impossible to get a Bible uh, internationally. Uh, and we've had a chance to hear uh, people that have worked for Open Doors in countries like Iran uh, that are, have to be extremely careful because if they find out about them, they'll literally kill them. I mean, it's, it's that serious. So uh, it's an amazing thing to hear what they're able to do in these countries. Um, and then the third ministry partner that we work with is an organization called Minis uh, Missionary Ventures, um, and they actually provide um, transportation to pastors around the world. And so if a pastor is in, a, in Nicaragua, for example, in fact, the very first pastor that got transportation was in Guatemala, and he had a small area that he was able to cover on foot. Uh, we gave him a motorcycle, and uh, he actually expanded his range to about a 10-mile radius to be able to go out and, and reach people in a 10-mile radius. And so uh, his effectiveness as a pastor went up. Well, we provided thousands of motorcycles, uh, bicycles, a camel, snowmobiles, um, I don't know, probably a yak somewhere. I don't know. We, 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 you know but we, we provide those for them, and we actually deliver that motorcycle or that bicycle to that pastor, and it's an amazing thing. And then 40% of the money we keep here in the United States. And, and I just briefly want to tell you about yesterday. Uh, a couple people here were actually down there, but uh, yesterday we had a chance to minister to people at Zion Harley-Davidson, and we did what's called a bike blessing. Uh, we were able to pray for 67 motorcyclists. We were able to provide Bibles to a lot of people that wanted them. Uh, we handed out hundreds of tracts to people uh, sharing the good news of Christ. Uh, we had crosses that we were able to give out for people to, to decorate their motorcycles with. Uh, we, we were able to just do a lot of ministry. And, and Barb, uh, yeah, and, and uh, angels, Barb hands out all kinds of angels. That's her ministry. So, uh, And if you haven't seen one of Barb's angels, go find her and she'll show you one or give you one, actually. Uh, they're an amazing, amazing ministry tool. But uh, Barb really loves it when uh, we're praying for a big old tough-looking biker wearing all kinds of leather and looks all grizzled and everything, and we start praying over him and asking God's blessing on him, and we open up our eyes at the end of the prayer, and the tears running down their cheeks, and she loves that, <laughs> that, they, can, that, they, that they actually, God brings them to tears uh, when we start praying for them. So it's, it's a great opportunity, and 40% of the money goes for those kinds of ministries, and uh, this year, in fact, we're looking at going up to Sturgis. Uh, the CMA will have a huge presence up in Sturgis, and and so uh, we do all kinds of activities around the country. So that's just kind of a brief summary of what Run for the Sun is about. If you'd like to uh, participate in it with us, there are the little flyers over on the side table. See Barbara and I, we both wear these, that patch there, um, and we'll be around after church. So thank you, Pastor. Thank you so, so much, Paul. Wonderful. Uh, Paul, just one more quick question. So it has to happen today, right? Because you have to... Uh, uh, for two weeks. Ah, okay, sorry. Okay, I missed it. Okay, so for two weeks. That's wonderful. Okay, and now I want to pray for all of our kids and for us in here again, and uh, then we'll sing a couple more songs. Thank you so much, Jesus, for this wonderful opportunity you give uh, Paul and Barb all the time to reach out to the other bikers and to people they meet at a gas station or wherever they go. I just am so thankful for, for the whole ministry, for CMA and... Um, it was just so wonderful to, to see it when, when Helen and I were able to go there to the headquarter, headquarters and meet some of the people there. That was so, so wonderful. We really believe in that ministry, and you reach so many people with the gospel through that. And now I want to pray for us here this morning, for all of our kids and, and, and for us, that you will just speak to us, that you will prepare us for this coming week as we reach out to our friends and neighbors and, and family members and uh, share the good news of Jesus with others. Please, Jesus, speak to every single one of us. I pray this in your name. Amen. Please stand with us as we worship our Lord Jesus now. We want to tell him how great he is, and we want to open up our hearts for him and to him and just show him how much we love him. Let's do this together. We want to be close. Close to your side, so heaven is real and death is a lie. I want 
want to hear voices of angels above singing as one hallelujah holy holy god almighty the great i am who is worthy none beside thee god almighty the great i am to be near, near to your heart, loving the world, hating the dark. I want to see dry bones living again, singing as one.
clap for the Lord because he's so good. He is the great I am. And I want to read a verse today from Lamentations 3, 22 to 23. It says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And we're just so thankful that the Lord is so good. We are overwhelmed by his goodness. Let's praise him. I see the work of all your hands. Sing it out to God.
opportunity that we can worship you, Lord, that we can even worship you, God, and that you're an intimate God, that you created the whole universe, but yet you still sent your son to die for us, God, that you sent your son to forgive us of our sins, God, so that we could be with you again, Lord. As Darren teaches today, God, I just pray that we could just trust your word, God, and that we could just rely on that, God, because your word is how you speak to us, Lord. I just pray that as he, we uh, learn today, God, that you would just just teach our hearts, God, and just draw us closer to you in this week, Lord, and just, uh, just watch over us, God, in Jesus' name. You guys did such a wonderful job in worshiping our Lord Jesus. Please be seated. Yeah, thank you so, so much. Hey, Darren, do you want to come up and share with us from God's Word this morning? I want to pray for you. I just want to go back to one more is that me? Okay. okay. Are we good? Okay. So in Isaiah 40, verse 8, we read, The word of our God stands forever. The word of our God stands forever. And I'm just so excited about what Darren has to share with us this morning because you want to share with us this morning that we can trust the word of God. And uh, I just want to pray for Darren and for, for all of us. Jesus, thank you so much that you gave us your word, and your word stands forever. Thank you so much, Jesus, that you are always the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that your word is always the same. And that we can trust your word. I just pray, Jesus, that you will speak through Darren to every single one of us. Give Darren the right words to say and give us the right heart and, and attitude to listen 
what you have for us this morning. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, we on? <laughs> Testing. There we go. Look. Okay, here we go. All right. Hey, Paul, is it okay if I show up at Zion Harley Davidson on my moped? They won't laugh at me? <laughs> if I can keep up, I'm welcome. All right. And I don't know about everyone else, but I'm looking forward to having your ugly mug up here a lot more. All right. As you can see, I just called him ugly. Now, do I really think he's ugly? No, I don't. I got to tell you, I have a weird, warped sense of humor. And uh, sometimes, everyone who works with me will, will attest to this. I'm a tease, and my favorite way to insult the people, to, to, to love on the people that I like, is to insult them. I do that all the time, do I not? Okay, yes. I felt bad all week because... Last week I got up here and I, I said we had to suffer through Harold's sermons for the next three weeks. And Harold knows what I mean by that. He know, it's my way of saying I love you, Harold. You know, he, he understands that. He didn't say anything about this to me or anything like that. This is just me. But uh, he understands that and people who know me understand that. But maybe those of you who don't know me personally might think, who's this guy to say suffer through. Who does he think he is? You know, and I'm sorry. I, I did not mean for it to come across like that. Nobody said anything to me about it. It's just, I feel like the Holy Spirit, except my wife. She's, she's the Holy Spirit for me, right? All right, guys, we know that. All right. Uh, anyway, when I say suffering through Harold's service, I hope you understand that what I meant is we love Harold's sermons, and it's just my, amen, it's just my lazy, it's easy, it's easy to be insulting, so it's like the Don Rickles thing, you know, it just comes natural. All right, moving on. Uh, okay, we got uh, some prizes to hand out, so I need my prize giver outers to come on up. If you did your homework, I would ask you to raise your hand. We have a book this, we talked about the Da Vinci Code and all those fake books that are out there. The last time I taught about this, this is a book called The Da Vinci Deception. Okay, uh, great little book. So if you guys could hand these out to the adults that raise their hands. So please do raise your hand um, if you did the homework. There you go. Mark chapter 16 was the homework. Raise your hands. All right. And then for the kids, when, when you guys come back, we have a book called The Case for Christ for Kids. Okay? And to sweeten it up, we got a sucker with it too. All right? All righty. So we have been doing a series. Did you hand them all out? We need one more? Oh, here's one more. This is called the Da Vinci Myth, but it's the same, same idea. Whew, that one worked out. Here you go. Come get your... And any other kids who did their homework, raise your hand. And there's uh, some little girl over there who did it. Olivia. All right. Okay, so the last time we did... Oh, and by the way, Harold, I think we're on the same page You've got that verse, the word of our God stands forever. Look at my first slide. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. We both had the same verse. To, I did not copy that, no. It was the Holy Spirit, Shelley, who told me to put that up there. No. The grass, the, so we're, we're going to do it on the, the New Testament. We, are, we already did the whole Old Testament. Already, we are now well into the New Testament, looking at uh, th that it is a reliable document. We've looked the last two times on why we have the books that we have in the New Testament. Now we will look at, okay, how do we know those books haven't been changed? Um, 
we do have this verse that says the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Now, some people misunderstand that to say that the paper that those documents were written on stands forever. Okay? Not so. He doesn't promise that the paper of our God or the book of our God stands forever. He promises that the words on that paper would stand forever. So do we have any original autographs or the original documents that the New Testament was written on? The answer is no, we do not. That may be disappointing for you, but as we go through this, I think you will see that um, it's almost good that we don't. Um, but as we think about that, don't be too disappointed that a document that was written on papyrus 2,000 years ago is not available to us today, okay? Uh, nor do we have any original of any ancient writings. Plato, Aristotle, whoever your favorite writer from antiquity is, we do not have any of their original documents, okay? None of them, not a one. Nor do we have any originals of any other world religion's scriptures. They all disintegrate. They just fall apart, okay? They just do. And if you would remember, remember the condition of the Dead Sea Scrolls when we did those back in the Old Testament? Here's a perfect situation for, for these scrolls to be preserved. Here they are in sealed in clay jars in a cave in a very dry climate, perfect conditions to, to uh, preserve a scroll. And yet, you see what they looked like. And when they rolled them apart, they just fell apart into fragments and they put puzzles together and whatnot. But anyway, that's in the perfect situation and yet they still fall apart. So we wouldn't expect them, a book that's written by Paul, that's being used over and over and over and over again to last for 2,000 years. You just wouldn't. Look at this. This is a Bible here that has been used over and over and over again. It's over 100 years old, this Bible is. But look, I mean, it's just falling apart. <laughs> the cover's coming off of it. And it's, it's just in very bad condition, and it's only a hundred years, a little over a hundred years old. Scrolls that last for 2,000 years is a miracle. And that's what the Dead Sea Scrolls are, by the way, a miracle. All right, so as we move into this, just be aware of that, but it's okay. Now, I'm going to burst your bubble a couple times today, but hopefully we'll refill it up real quickly, okay? How many manuscripts do we have of the, uh, the New Testament? I want to make some comparisons. Last week we talked about, or the last time, I keep saying week and it means a month ago. Anytime I say week, that means a month. Uh, we talked about these other books that appeared, like the Gospel of Mary Magdalene and the Gospel of Judas and that kind of thing. And if you want to get the whole... If you weren't here, it's all online on Facebook, on our Facebook page. And I think, isn't it on our website now, or is it? The videos are on our website? They are, okay. Um, and you can see why we dismiss these other books that came to light, because the Gospel of Judas was not written by Judas. It was written by somebody else hundreds of years ago who put Judas's name on it because they wanted it to get popular, Okay. But we do have these old books that they found. Uh, for instance, the Gospel of Thomas. We have four copies or fragments of that particular book. Actually, one copy, three fragments of that book. The Gospel of Philip, which was not written by Thomas or Philip, by the way. Okay, again, watch the video. We have one fragmented copy of it. The Gospel of Mary, Magdalene, right here, this one. We have, where'd it go? 
we have one fragmented copy of it. The Gospel of Peter, one fragmented copy of it. Okay, these are the books that we talked about two months ago now, because we did the Passover last time. Um, God did not see fit to preserve these books with multiple manuscripts and whatnot. Now, let's compare the New Testament. The New Testament, we have 5,800 Greek copies or fragments of the New Testament. Look at that difference. And that's just Greek. That's what the New Testament was written in. So those are the important ones, uh, you know, that we get the original language. But on top of that, there are over 20,000 other ancient manuscripts of the New Testament in other languages that we have available to us. So that makes almost 30,000 ancient manuscripts of the New Testament available to us as opposed to one or two or three copies of. And we'll look at some other books uh, and make some comparisons also. One guy that I have been quoting a lot through this series is Bart Ehrman. He is a critic of the Bible. He does not believe the Bible came down to us uh, reliably. And uh, this is a book called Misquoting Jesus. And this guy is the numero uno critic of the Bible today. Okay? If you hear, if you watch anything on YouTube about criticism of the Bible, you will hear his name mentioned. He, and he is a scholar. He is a Greek scholar. All right? Now, this is his book here, Misquoting Jesus, The Story Behind Who Changed the Bible and Why. Okay? Now, it's interesting as you read through this and listen to debates by Bart, the things that he says that make you think, well, why are you even going? In? This is a quote by him. There are more copies by far of any other ancient writings. Part of it got cut off there, I think. Anyway, he's saying that with the New Testament, there are more copies by far than any other ancient writing in the world today for the New Testament. The, 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 the foremost critic of the Bible says this, more than far by any, that other, any other ancient writing. And I'll show you some other quotes out of this book as we go along. All right, I want to make some comparisons now. So I want to look at the author of some ancient books, the name of the book, the date when it was written, the earliest copy that we have today available of that book, and the time gap between the date that he wrote it and our earliest copy, and the number of ancient manuscripts that we have. Number two, easily, the New Testament, I'll tell you right off, is number one. Okay, number two is a book called the Iliad. Okay, this, back in the days of Jesus, was kind of the Shakespeare of our day. Okay, the Shakespeare. And everybody heard about Homer and the Iliad. And if you had even one book in your house, this was the book you had. Just like a lot of you may have Shakespeare in your, on your bookshelf. You've never read it. But it's on your bookshelf because it looks really, makes you look smart because you have it on your bookshelf. Um, anyway, this is, everyone back in the ancient world knew about this book, okay? And so, here's what we got. The Iliad was written about 800 B.C. The earliest copy we have of it is 400 B.C. And so there's 400 years between the time that Homer wrote it and the earliest copy that we have today, a 400-year gap between those two periods. And there are about a thousand ancient manuscripts that we have of Homer's Iliad, okay? Which is a lot, a huge amount for any ancient writing. Okay, I have been, I have referred in the past to Herodotus, the histories of Herodotus. I've used him back when I was doing the Old Testament. 
He wrote 450 BC, but our earliest copy that we have is from 900 AD. That means that there is a 1,350 year gap between the time that Herodotus wrote this book and the earliest copy that we have today. That huge time span. What happened to this book over that time period? Nobody knows because we only have eight ancient copies of this book. Another one that I will be using is Pliny the Elder as we get into the history of Jesus himself. There are many witnesses outside of the Bible that talk about Jesus. He wrote about 400 B.C. No, Pliny, okay, I got, no, this is Plato, sorry. <laughs> Plato, I don't have Plato up here. Plato, he wrote about 400 B.C. Our earliest copy for him is 900 A.D., 1,300 years, yet we hear Plato quoted all the time, right? And yeah, the Plato said this, Plato said that, but there's a 1,300-year gap between the time that Plato wrote and the earliest copy that we have of his manuscript. Okay, Pliny the Elder, he wrote around 100 A.D. Our earliest copy for him is 850 A.D., 750 years gap between the two. And I've also mentioned Josephus. I've quoted him as we did earlier teachings, and I will be quoting from him again. But again, he wrote around 75 AD, and our earliest copy we have of this book is from 1150 AD. That's 1,075-year gap, if I did my math right. And we have about 120 ancient copies of Josephus, which is extraordinary for an ancient book. They say 120 copies, ancient copies we have of that. That's unprecedented aside from Homer's Iliad and the New Testament. The New Testament was written between 50 and 100 AD. Our earliest fragment of the New Testament is from 120 AD. That's a 20 a 25-year gap between the time that John, and it's a fragment of John, by the way, and John is believed to have written last in the 90s, 90 AD, yet we have a fragment of his book from 120 AD, 20 to 25-year gap between the time John wrote and our earliest fragment of his book. You see that difference? And look at the, the number again of copies, ancient copies, 5,800 copies, ancient manuscripts of the New Testament. The Bible stands alone, completely alone, in, in the number of copies that we have and the, the uh, reliability of the transmission of the words in there and, and the, the, the time gap between when it was written and our earliest copies. I'm not talking about in the Middle East. I'm talking about in the world. There, are, there is no book in the world from the ancient times that we have more manuscripts of than the New Testament. This is another quote from Bart Erdman. The New Testament is the earliest attested document in all of antiquity. Okay, that's our critic of the Bible saying this. Okay, let me burst your bubble for a minute. Okay, one of the things, now, you have to be careful in reading these books because he gives a lot of half-truths in here. I, I, I can't help but to believe that he's being a little deceptive when he gives us some of these things that I'm going to share with you now, okay? One thing that he stands up here, he stands, he teaches at universities, and this is what he teaches, trying to disprove the Bible. That's his study, okay? And he stands in front of a crowd of kids like this and tells them there are 
four of those 5,800 manuscripts of the Greek New Testament, there are 400,000 variants within those 5,800 copies. A variant means differences, changes. Does that burst your bubble? And by the way, it's true. It is true. But I'm only giving you half the truth right now. We'll give you the other half in just a second. Okay? He'll also say that there are more changes in those documents, those 5,000 then there are words in the New Testament. Does that burst your bubble? It's true. But it's only half the truth. Hang in there. Hang in there. Okay? And this is the kind of thing he does. He gets up there and, and says these kind of things to a group of people like this who are just going boom, boom knocking the sword out of their hand. And, and then they walk out of that university an atheist, which is, his, which is what he intends. But when you watch a debate, and I've said this before, when you watch a debate between Bart Erdman and another Christian scholar, Bart Erdman says these same things that I just told you, okay? But the guy at the other podium now gives you the other half of the story, okay? And I'm sure Bart hates that, but he still likes to go boom, you know, and, and get that, that, that sucker punch in, all right? It is true, of the 5,800 manuscripts that we have, there are somewhere around 4,000, 400,000 differences in those manuscripts, okay? But this may seem like a staggering figure to the uninformed mind, but to those who study the issue, the numbers are not so devastating as it may initially appear. Indeed, a look at the hard evidence shows that the New Testament manuscripts are amazingly accurate and trustworthy. How can we say that with 400,000 variants? To begin, we must emphasize that out of these 400,000 variants, over 99% hold no significance whatsoever. Most of these variants simply involve a missing letter in a word. Some involve reversing the order of two words, such as Christ Jesus instead of Jesus Christ. Some may involve the absence of an, insign of an insignificant word. 99% of these variants are just leaving a letter out of a word or spelling it differently because as, as time goes by, languages change and, and, there's, and, there, and, and changes like... Again, these, these variants change nothing in our doctrine, okay? They're just minor little things that you and I reading it would just skip over. 99% of it, we would just skip over them and not miss one thing that the, the author was trying to tell us, okay? Now, if you were to take the manuscripts that we have of the Bible, ancient Bible, they would stack up a mile high, a mile high. That's almost four Empire State Buildings. That's how many manuscripts we have. Now, if you look at that and say 400,000 variants in that stack, that's only one variant and about every four feet of manuscripts. One missing letter in four feet. One word change in four feet of documents. Do you see? When you get the other half of the story, all of a sudden those 400,000 variants become meaningless. And we'll do an exercise here to show you how meaningless it is. All right? Let's say we have a verse in the Bible that says, you open your Bible and it says, Jesus Christ is the Savior of the whole world, okay? And we have, let's say, 10 ancient manuscripts that have that verse on it, okay? We've found different manuscripts, and not one of them reads the same, not one of them. 
of these 10. Let's do this exercise. And this is, this is exactly what we're, we're talking about with these 400,000, all right? The first ancient manuscript says, Jesus Christ, comma, the Savior of the whole world. Our next manuscript says, Jesus Christ is the Savior of the whole world. Our third manuscript says, Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. They left out the word whole. Number four says, Christ Jesus is the Savior of the whole world. They switched Jesus and Christ. Our next ancient manuscript says, Jesus Christ is the Savior of the whole world, but they spelt the Savior the old English style there. Okay? Our sixth manuscript leaves out the vowels in Jesus Christ because they used to do that a lot out of reverence for the name. They would do that. So Jesus, spelt out that way, is the Savior of the whole world. Our seventh manuscript says Jesus Christ is the Savior of the whole world. Oh, look, they misspelled whole. They used the other whole instead of this whole. That's the kind of one I would do right there. Seriously. Jesus Christ is the, is the Savior, no, is Savior of the whole world. They left out the in between is and Savior. Our ninth manuscript says Jesus is the Savior of the whole world. So it doesn't say Jesus Christ, it says Jesus. Our tenth manuscript says Christ is the Savior of the whole world, and it leaves out Jesus. Okay? Now, a Bart Ehrman could say to you, without going through the details of it, he would get up here and he would say to you, that verse, we have more variants of that verse than there are words in the verse. Doesn't that sound devastating? Until you look at what those variants are. You see that? What do we know the author said here? Because we have 10 manuscripts of it, we know what the author said. The author said, Jesus Christ is the Savior of the whole world. There's no question about that. Yet, there are more variants right there than there are letters in that verse. What if we had 40 of these and, you know, they, it's just a, 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 a misspell, a, a letter missing on one and another letter missing on another. We would still even, we would know even more for sure that his intention was Jesus Christ is the Savior of the whole world. Bart Ehrman would get up here and say, there are more variants in those 40 uh, ancient manuscripts than there are letters in this verse. That would sound devastating to an audience like this if you didn't know what he was talking about. There's no question of what the author was intending to say here, yet not one of them reads the same. And are you ready for this? Not one of them says, Jesus Christ is the Savior of the whole world. Not one of those says that completely, if you look at it. Yet... Is there any question as to what the author wanted to say? It's completely, we, we know exactly what the author had to say. And all of those minor variants mean nothing in the transmission of what was trying to be said. Okay, now, I have to, I wouldn't be being fair and I wouldn't be being honest if I told you there weren't, that there were, uh, there are a couple of places in the New Testament where scholars are trying to figure out, was this in the original? Two places where there are some major questions about, was this in the original copy? And one of them is your homework assignment, Mark chapter 16. If you read that, you may have seen in brackets that the last... I think 11 verses of Mark, it's questionable if those are in the original document of Mark. The ending of Mark. Your Bible may have 
a footnote that says something like this. The most reliable early manuscripts of the Gospel of Mark end at verse 8, yet there's about 20 verses in the chapter. The majority of manuscripts include the longer ending immediately after verse 8. So here's the problem. Most ancient manuscripts, almost all of them, have that last section in Mark that's in your Bible, the last 11 verses. But there are a couple of ancient manuscripts, and they are the oldest ones that do not contain those last 11 verses. So the scholars have to figure out, okay, hey, most of them have these verses, but the earliest ones don't have these verses. And this is a legitimate, legitimate place here where we can say, okay, there's been some kind of possible corruption here in the New Testament in these, this particular place, okay? Now, what do we lose? Let's just say it was not supposed to be in there and somebody added it later. What do we lose? Bart Ehrman gets up here and he says, you lose the doctrine of the resurrection. You lose the doctrine of go out into the whole world. You lose so much. That is so not true. Because guess what? First of all, Mark, even if you take out those last verses, you still have an empty tomb at the end. All right? And even if those verses are not there that says, go out into the world, does not Matthew and Luke and John say the same thing? Okay? Just because you lose it in one place doesn't mean you, it's erased from the Bible. He makes it act like, he acts like it's been erased from the Bible. It's no longer in your Bible, the resurrection. Totally untrue. Totally untrue. This one doesn't hurt so bad because there's stuff in, and, you know, it talks about handling snakes. And if you read it, if you get bit by a snake, poisonous snake, it won't hurt you. Uh, I don't mind losing that verse, to be honest with you. <laughs> you know, snake handlers, churches ought to know that this is questionable as to whether it was in there. I, by the way, I personally tend to lean towards that it, was, it, it is in the original. And scholars from both sides make a great case for yes, it is, yes, it, no, it's not. And I lean towards it is. But I will tell you, most scholars disagree with me on that. And I am not a scholar, please. Do not hear me saying that. Not at all. Um, okay, but this one doesn't hurt so bad. The next one hurts. Okay, because it's one of our favorite stories in the New Testament. Harold preached on it uh, six months ago or so. And this one hurts because we don't know for sure that this particular story is in the original of the New Testaments. And it is John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11, the adulterous woman that is brought before Jesus. We caught this woman in the very act of adultery. What should we do with her? You who are without sin, cast the first stone. And they all get up and leave, and Jesus writes in the dust, and he says, where did they all go? And he tells her to go and sin no more. We love that story, don't we? It's questionable whether or not that was in the original uh, version of the Bible. And the reason it's questionable is because it says, your, your Bible may say the most ancient Greek manuscripts do not include those 11 verses, uh, 12 verses, actually. Uh, and that one, that one, we're like, oh, man. Love that story. And again, the problem is almost every ancient manuscript of the New Testament has this story in it. Almost every one of them. There's, I can, you can count on, I think, one hand of ancient manuscripts that do not have this story in it. But they are the oldest manuscripts. Okay? So thousands of not as old ones have it, but the very few oldest ones don't. So the scholars grapple with this. Is it or is it not? It's questionable, okay? And I'm just being honest with you all. 
I don't want, especially you young people, you get out there witnessing to people and you tell them there's been no changes and someone brings this up to you. I want you to be prepared, okay, that these two places are legitimate places where we question, are these stories in the Old Testament? Uh, uh, are these legitimate from the New Testament? Okay. Um, but how many more are there? That's it, folks. Two places in the New Testament. This is it right here. Okay. The rest of it, unquestionable. It's unquestionable. All right. Uh, and again, what do we lose? Bart Ehrman gets up here and he says, with this, we lose your Bible. You can no longer say that Jesus forgives sin because this one may not have been in the original. Well, is there anywhere else in the New Testament where Jesus claims to forgive sin? Of course there is. There's multiple places. We don't lose that. Well, you lose the compassionate heart of Jesus. Oh, we do. So this woman was the only person that Jesus had compassion on in the New Testament? No, no, not at all. So again, he takes something like this and turns it into this huge, and he makes it sound like, and this is just the beginning. Let's, let me just give you a couple examples, Bart would say, and he'll bring these up, and then he'll move on to something else. But what did he feel? He, he just planted a seed in your mind that, this is just a couple of examples. No, this is the only examples, okay? But he makes it sound like there's more and more and more and more. All right. Now, let's look at, oh, first of all, this gives us, this should actually give us confidence, these two sections, because is your Bible trying to hide this problem? Most of you who did your homework probably saw a little note in your Bible that says, most ancient man, the most earliest ancient manuscripts do not, and they might bracket this out or something like that, okay? There is no intentional deceit happening here. If there is a manuscript issue, it is addressed, not hidden. Your Bible addresses it. Unlike several other religions in the world where mistakes are removed and hidden without footnote as if the mistake never existed. Okay, I'm not going to mention any names. But just know that there are religious books out there that have had huge sections taken out of it or added into it, much more than the Bible, yet they just vanish. And you, the average reader, would never know that there was a change made here because there's no footnotes whatsoever. You'd have to do some deep, deep digging to find that there was a huge section taken out here. In your Bible, that's not the case. They're being very transparent. They're saying, okay, hey, look, our Bible is, is virtually perfect, but there are some issues, and there's two of them, right? That's the two biggest ones right here. Nobody's trying to hide anything, okay? It's complete transparency. So this should give you confidence that that's why you have the footnotes at the bottom of the page. Some will say, some manuscripts say, ah, uh, instead of and. They're just being as transparent and giving you as much information as you need to understand what's, what the Bible's all about. All right, so I said 99%, almost out of time, 99% of these variants are meaningless. A letter missing here, that means 1% are not meaningless, right? Okay, now let me, sh that shouldn't even scare you because I wanna show you just one example and this is very, com this is similar to all the rest of them, okay? The, the, the example of meaningful variance. Here is a meaningful, what, what, what the scholars consider a meaningful variant, okay? In Matthew 4, 26, 36, Jesus is speaking, and he's talking about when he will come again. And he says, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. That's from the New King James Version, which is from much younger translations. Okay, about the, the King James and the New King James are translated from Manuscripts are about, a about from a 1,000 A.D., 
okay? But then along comes the New American Standard Bible, which is taken from much earlier translations, much older translations, and they say this, but about that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. This is considered a meaningful variant right here, okay? Now, has it, has it changed anything? Okay, it added three words here, nor the Son, but it hasn't changed the meaning of it. Look at the one that doesn't have that. It still is implied that Jesus doesn't know. He says, no one knows, not even the angels, but my Father only. Jesus is basically saying, my Father only knows when my return will be. And that's the whole thing. I'm not going to get into the theology of that right now. But the variant there adds, nor the Son. Well, that's implied in the other. There hasn't been any meaningful change. So what I'm saying is of the 100 meaningful variants that are in the New Testament, they do not change any essential doctrines of the New Testament at all. Okay? They will switch. Instead of saying Jesus Christ, they'll say Christ Jesus. That's considered a meaningful variant. We don't know. We're not sure if it was originally Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ. And so they call it meaningful because some, you know, 50% of the copies say Christ Jesus, 50% say Jesus Christ. But it doesn't mean anything. And that's what the, vari the meaningful variants are, are things that do not change the meaning of the doctrines one bit, not one bit. I want you to be confident that even the me what they call meaningful variants do not change the doctrines of the New Testament one bit, all right? As a matter of fact, even in the New King James Version, you might say, well, it doesn't have nor the Son. But if you look at the parallel verse in Mark from the New King James Version, look what it says. But that, that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father. Okay, so this one who, where they say, oh, it, it's not there in that, in that uh, uh, ancient manuscript. Well, it is here. In the very same ancient manuscript, it is there. Okay, these variants mean nothing. Take confidence. When you are reading the Bible that's on your lap, you are reading what the authors intended you to read. Okay, let me give you a quote out of, this is at the very back in the appendix of this book. Bart Ehrman was a student of Bruce Metzger. Bruce Metzger, as Bart will admit, is one of the greatest New Testament scholars in the world. And Bart Ehrman sat under Bruce Metzger in his, in his university classes. And this is what Bart says at the back in the appendix of this book that he hopes nobody will read, okay? <laughs> it's after the footnotes and, and whatnot. Here's what he says. <clears throat> Bruce Metzger is one of the greatest scholars of modern times. I have nothing but respect and admiration for him. And even though we may disagree on important religious questions, he is a firmly committed Christian, and I am not. We are in complete agreement on a number of very important historical and textual questions. So there he's giving us uh, his respect for the man. Now watch this. If he and I were put in a room and asked to hammer out a consensus statement on what we think the original text of the New Testament probably looked like, there would be very few points of disagreement, maybe one or two dozen places out of many thousands. The position I argue for does not actually stand at odds with Professor Medzger's position, that the essential Christian beliefs are not affected by textual variants in the manuscript tradition of the New Testament. That's what Bart Ehrman, the biggest critic of the Bible, in his appendix in this book says, Okay, now that I've tried to destroy the Bible for you, at the very end he says, oh, and by the way, nothing, no, 
the textual variance in the manuscript tradition of the New Testament affects no Christian doctrines. Okay? Well, why'd you write the book then? Why? Ask yourself why. He does, he's not a believer, and he wants you to not be a believer either because that's lonely, and he wants the world to come onto his side. Okay? And so he goes through giving all of these half-truths that completely make the audience go, oh, like that. But then at the very end, he says, oh, by the way, everything that I just said was misleading because nothing's really been changed. All right. I'm out of time. Uh, you can just look at this percentage of purity. The Hindu scriptures, they figure 90% pure. That means one in 10 words is in question. The Iliad by Homer, this one that I showed you, they figure is about 90%, 95% pure of what we have here. We figure 95% of what we read in this book is actually what Homer wrote. But that still means that one out of 20 words is in question. The Old Testament, because of the Dead Sea Scrolls, they are now confident that, that it is 99% uh, uh, pure. That means that one out of every 100 words in the Old Testament is in question. We're not sure if this one word was... And I showed you, remember, we went through the a whole chapter, and I showed you, okay, this one word right here is not in this, trans, in, in this old, ancient... Change nothing, absolutely nothing. But the New Testament, they figure is 99.5% pure. That means one out of every 200 words is in question. Was this and or was it a? Was it Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ? Okay, that means one out of 200 words, that is approximately one word per chapter that they're not sure, was this a uh, here or was it not there? You can completely be confident in the Bible that is sitting on your lap. And even, I'll just read this. In addition to the many thousands of New Testament manuscripts, there are over 86,000 quotations of the New Testament in the early church fathers. There are also New Testament quotations in thousands of early church lectionaries, which were work, worship books. So the next generation after the apostles who lived in the early 200s, they wrote books and they quoted from the Bible over, well, over 86,000 times. So listen, there are enough quotations from the early church fathers that even if we did not have a single ancient copy of the Bible, scholars could still reconstruct all of it but 11 verses of the entire New Testament from material written within 100 to 200, with, from 150 to 200 years from the time of Christ. So even if we did not have these 5,800 ancient manuscripts, all we'd have to do is go to the next generation of people, Christians who wrote and just look in their Bibles or their, their books and say, oh, he's quoting Mark 13 here. Okay, he's quoted, this guy's Mark, quoting Mark 14 here. We could put the whole Bible back together without even one ancient manuscript. But we have 5,800 Greek, over almost 30,000 ancient manuscripts in all of the... All right, uh, just real quick, the Science Minute, 1 Corinthians 15:41. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, and one star differs from, differs from another star in, that's, that says in glory or magnitude, okay? Back in the days of the Bible, they just thought those were specks in the sky. Maybe there was some canvas there or something like that, and there were poked, holes poked in the canvas, and the light was coming through. They had no idea what stars were, and yet somehow Paul knows that there are different stars and there's different magnitudes of different stars. And today we know that absolutely. Okay, this big one here is not the sun. That's one of the biggest stars that we know about right there. Okay, and none of those are the sun. 
Actually, the sun is up in the top corner here. You might see a dot. That's the size of our sun compared to these other stars. Okay, Paul was absolutely right. There is major differences in the stars, even though they all look the same to the eye. Somehow Paul knew there were different magnitudes. And they just discovered recently, look at the bottom one there. It wouldn't even fit on the screen. Again, our, our sun is a little pixel up there in the top left. Okay, so again, how did Paul know that? I would suggest to you that God inspired him to know that. Okay, we can have our worship team come up. Um, all of this stuff is very important. Okay, I call it the, the head of the gospel, meaning here, knowledge. It's, and it's important to have all of this, okay? But the more important thing is what happens <clears throat> when Harold comes up here and teaches us about the heart of the gospel, the heart of the gospel, okay? I teach you that the Bible is true and that you should believe in it, but he teaches to believe in it. Not just to know it up here, but to teach it here. So next week when he gets up here and uh, teaches from John, be sure that you can know that what he is teaching is what John wrote. Okay? And so I have just shared with you that John wrote it. He will come up here next week and teach you the heart of it. Not just the head of it, but the heart of it. Okay, and that's what's so important. That's why I tell the young people who have an interest in, in apologetics, uh, great, good, go for it, but don't make that your relationship with God. Make that an, a side in, uh, issue, a side interest that you can know that what you're believing is true, but then read it and actually move it from here to here. And to do that, we have to spend time in God's Word, not just investigating about it, but believing in it. I am about here. He is in when he is here, okay? And so, I would encourage you, um, God preserved this book for a reason, not just for us to, do, to learn all the facts about it, but to actually read it and see what God has to say and apply it to our lives. And just knowing all of this stuff knows that I am applying truth. I'm not applying fiction. I'm not applying maybes. I'm applying truth that we know beyond a reasonable doubt that this book is indeed the Word of God. And so, with that in mind, move it down to here. Thank you. There was a point in our life, right? We saw the light. We saw Jesus come into our heart, changing our life. And we know where we go. If we leave this world, we'll fly away with him. And let's just praise him through that song.
guys did awesome. That was so good. Is this on? Hello? Okay. Thank you so much, Jesus, that you love us so, so much. And thank you so much, Jesus, that you are with us right now. Thank you so much that we learned this morning that we can fully trust your word, that your word is the truth. And I just pray that you will help us this coming week as we go through life, that we apply what we learn in your word, that we are able to share the good news with others. And I'm so thankful that we're able to sing together. Thank you so much, Jesus, that you love us so much, and I pray all of this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So please stay a little bit longer. If you want our prayer team to pray for you, please uh, look for one of them. Thank you so, so much for coming and see you next week. Thanks. <laughs>